we saw a lot of athletes uh, that came from other coaches and uh, did much lower volumes when we uh, guided the coaches. Yeah, and then suddenly they be, they were um, they were really amazed that by doing less they were faster in competition. The Triathlon Show, one hundred ninety eight. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Jan Olbrecht, who I have been looking forward to talking with since episode one of this podcast. He has been one of my most wished for guests so you can bet that I'm really excited about finally getting to talk to him and uh, bring his knowledge to you, the listeners. And uh, many of you, I am sure, are already very familiar with Jan and his work. But for those of you who aren't, he is a former elite swimmer. He holds a PhD in sports physiology and biomechanics. And he has advised athletes who have won over 600 Olympic World Championship, European Championship and Commonwealth Championship medals in different endurance sports. He is also the author of the highly influential book, The Science of Winning, which uh, talks about periodization, training structure, uh, physiology, and using physiology and lactate testing to deliver peak performances. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to our sponsors. First, we have Precision Hydration. And uh, I mentioned their blog many times in the past. It's uh, a great uh, resource for knowledge about endurance sports in general and uh, hydration in particular. One very interesting recent article that I read there is called Should You Combine Your Carbohydrate and Electrolyte Drinks? And uh, you can go and read that, look it up on on the blog, but uh, the net of it is that uh, uh, pH typically suggests getting the most of your calories from more solid foods or chews or bars, uh, and that's the approach that they think result in less overall gastrointestinal distress for the majority of athletes, especially in the heat or during very long events. And uh, they think that this is uh, because when you eat solid food and drink uh, drink only water and electrolytes, your stomach is better able to control the rate that calories move uh, from there into your gut and the small intestine, where they are ultimately absorbed into the bloodstream. And the reason for this is because the food comes together as uh, a bolus in the stomach, which uh, enables slower digestion and absorption in comparison to only taking on liquids. So check the blog out, and uh, if you're interested in trying Precision Hydration's electrolyte products, then remember to use the promo code DEATTRIATHLONSHOW, all one word, all caps, to get your first box or tube for free on precisionhydration.com. Big thanks as well to Roka that you can find on roka.com, and uh, very, very big news, interesting news from Roka, is that they have brought the Maverick wetsuit line to swim run. And we've done a few swim run episodes in the past on this show. And as you know, I'm a big fan. I think it's a fantastic sport. So to see that Roka has entered the swim run market is uh, absolutely amazing. And it will definitely uh, help swim runners keep pushing the limits of what can be done in this unique sport. And it will also make sure that all swim run wetsuit manufacturers up their game and and help swim runners uh, achieve even greater feats than they have so far so uh, really really exciting news with the maverick uh, line now entering the swim run segment as well you can check out all of roca's products wetsuits tri suits swim skins swim run suits etc on roca.com and you can get 20 percent off your entire order with the promo code tts all caps without any further ado let's hear the interview with uh, jan olbrecht So welcome, Jan, to that triathlon show. It's a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm very fine at the moment. So thanks a lot. It's uh, something that I've been looking forward to, to talk to you. So I'm yes. glad that you're here. Uh, can, uh-huh. can you start by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your background? Okay. So um, I'm uh, living in Belgium. I have a wife and two beautiful daughters, so I have plenty of things to do, you can imagine. And um, what I, when I was young, I was uh, a swimmer on uh, international level. 
And uh, after my studies in Brussels, I went to Cologne because I was very interested in sports medicine. And I got the opportunity there to, uh, let's say, to do my PhD in, uh, in physiology and biomechanics. And um, I was so passionate with uh, about these uh, disciplines. And most of all, what I like to do is really to bring this science or these scientific findings back to uh, something coaches can use. And uh, that's my, uh, let's say, my passion. And uh, how long have you been doing that? When, when did you graduate from uh, the University of Cologne? Oh, Cologne, I, I think I finished my studies 1991, 1991. So it's already a long time ago. Mm, yeah. And uh, you've done some, uh, some really pioneering work in, in, for example, the work with lactate testing. And a lot of that you have uh, described in your book, Science of, Women, or Science of Winning, uh, which uh, yeah. discusses swimming specifically. But this also, I think, applies to other endurance sports. In general, can you can you explain how science of winning and the concepts that you described there, uh, if they yeah. are uh, applicable in other endurance sports like running, triathlon, cycling, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, during the, my uh, studies in Cologne, uh, we had a lot of debates about lactate testing in Germany because there you had pro people, contra people, and uh, so there was a lot of discussions. And this, uh, thanks to my uh, promoter, Professor Mada. Uh, who was really one of the professors who really re-questioned the whole story about lactate. And that brought us to, uh, let's say, an approach which is uh, relatively different of what other people are doing. And uh, for my PhD, I worked uh, that out for swimming. But uh, most of the principles of what we could find are certainly applicable also for other sports. And um, even with, without lactate testing, you can certainly learn a lot of these uh, theories. Uh, for example, some of them is that um, in order to improve your aerobic capacity, yeah, mm -hmm. most of the people think you have to do a lot of volume at low intensities, etc. And uh, we found out in from from research that in fact the best way to improve your aerobic capacity is to do a certain volume, but certainly not too much. And also, if you don't mix easy efforts with some short, very intensive bouts, so at high intensity, you will never have an optimal improvement of your aerobic capacities. And if you know times to run or times to row or, or frequencies to row, in fact, that's not so important as long as you look for enough contrast. That means if you have a training session that is meant to improve your aerobic capacity, please run a lot easy, not too much, but a lot easy, and alternate it or spice it with some very intensive short distance of, well, let's say, efforts from about 30 to 45 seconds. And that works very well in every sport. That's a, a great lead into uh, to a topic that I want to discuss, which is uh, aerobic and anaerobic capacity and power. And uh, you describe these in Science of Winning and how to develop them. So can you talk more about that? Yeah. So that's also something very new in the approach of endurance training. And that's also one of the results of our studies is that, in fact, where people uh, in the past considered endurance only based on well, on an effort that you can maintain for a long time of period period of time yeah we found that in fact you have to make a difference between what your muscle fibers are able to produce aerobic energy compared to what you're really during your efforts you perform. And I can give you a very example, a very easy example, and that make it, will make it much clearer. If you see a car driving very fast on the highway, you will automatically make 
an assumption of what for an engine that car must have to be so fast. So you make it automatically a difference between performance, that's how fast is a car driving, and also what power, what strength must be in the engine to really create that speed. And that's something we apply as well on aerobic metabolism as the anaerobic metabolism. That is that at first instance, we speak about aerobic capacity, which is really a property of your muscle uh, fibers. And then in a second perspective, what are you doing with these capacities? And as soon as you can do something with these capacities, that's what we mention power. And we have very beautiful examples where, for example, you have a marathon runner or triathletes with the same maximal oxygen uptake at the level of the muscle fibers, but where maybe even the weakest or the guy with the lowest aerobic capacity, that means with the lowest property, muscles with the lowest property to use oxygen, yeah, can win the race. And that's not because there is a, a running efficiency or working efficiency, but it's because the guy with the lower capacities, but with better cap- uh, possibilities to use these capacities, he will beat the guy with the strong, with the better capacities. And that makes a big difference in training objectives, in the planning of training objectives. That is that if we can measure that someone has very high capacities but doesn't perform well, then we know that the problem is in the powers on the power side. And these exercises for power are totally different as if you want to improve the capacities. Uh, you can have a good performance from a triathlete. Nevertheless, you can see that there is a low capacity in the in his engine if, or in his muscle fibers. That means that really he need to exploit nearly everything he has to perform well. But that also means that there is a very high risk for injuries. There is a very high risk for overload or overuse of his metabolism and therefore also overtraining. So what we want to make clear for each athlete or let's say rather the coach is to have a view on whether your athlete needs better capacity or he needs better power so let- and that's let's say a big difference with with uh, with the past where everybody was working on power without taking either, any consideration about the capacities so so let me let me try to repeat what you said here and and correct me if I'm wrong here but I'm just going to make a summary if we go to the engine analogy then your capacity uh, your aerobic or anaerobic capacity that's sort of like your the size of your engine yeah. and the power is uh, how much of that engine can you use can you operate at 80% or 90% per, 90% or 70% of yeah. of that engine size is yep. that right? That's 100% correct. And, in and most of the times st- we speak about capacities of an ing- engine, about uh, the cylinder. If you have a four-cylinder or five or six or eight or 12-cylinder car, that speaks to – that reflects the capacity. Yeah. And uh, and when it comes to how the things that you then went on to talk about, you said that some athletes might have a very good capacity, but they have low power. So even though they are – very talented they can do really great things for example in in testing and in training perhaps but they can't perform just because they can't use that capacity to uh, to the extent that they should to uh, to really be perform at top level but other athletes might have the opposite problem that they they are really operating at a high, high power uh, but they have a low capacity so that means that they're always at the risk of injury and overtraining because they are so so close to the edge is uh, yeah. with, were those correct that's 100% correct. And unfortunately, what we see in praxis is that you can never, in good athletes, improve power and capacity at the same time. So that means that you always have to plan in advance when 
is it is it good or when is it uh, let's say the best time to improve my capacities and therefore certain training exercise will be very appropriated and when do i have to spend time to prepare a race and there mainly power training power exercises power sets will be important just to maximize the power according to the capacities and that will bring you to good performance because power is very important for performance in races but on the other side capacities are really very important to enable the coach to estimate what is affordable in training so capacities is for training and power is for races mm, that, that's a great distinction can, can you give an example for example with a swimmer uh, because i'm sure you have a lot of those examples of uh, a workout that is uh, designed to uh, to work on aerobic capacity versus uh, aerobic power so two two workouts yeah. to show, show the yeah. dis- difference for the listeners so very general over all sports, yeah? you can say if I have a certain set, a certain exercise that lasts, for example, 50 minutes, or let's say take 40 minutes, that's easier for calculations, <laughs> then at least for aerobic capacity work, at least three-fifths of these 40 minutes that's uh, free t- is 24 minutes, should be at a very, very low pace. So easy, slowly. Yeah? And only at maximum, two-fifths of the exercise may be at high speed. And in order to achieve that high speed, yeah, you should work with very short efforts. Because if you say, okay, I go for a very high speed during five minutes, that's, that's not possible. Yeah, you will lose speed because it lasts so long, your effort. Yeah? And to come back to your question, if, for example, you go in swimming and you say, okay, well, today we will do um, 10 times 200 yeah? or 9 times 200, then let's say at least from this, or let's say what you can do as high intensity is to say, okay, all even repetitions, yeah? the first 50 meter is as fast as possible, and all the rest is easy. Mm. Yeah? So you have the 50 meter with a, high, a very high spike of intensity, and you have then the other, let's say, uh, distance swam at a very low speed. And that you can translate to rowing, to cycling, to um, to, to, to running. That that's, that's a very general rule. On the opposite, if you really want to use the same exercise, this 9 times 200, yeah, for power development, then you will say, okay, what we would like to do is, for example, we split it in 3 times, 3 times 200. And, this, and the block of 3 times 200, we will swim every 200 as fast as possible, yeah? with, let's say, only 30 seconds rest. And then after the three times 200 meter, you can take a longer rest of one minute or two minutes, and then you repeat again these three times 200 at the highest possible average. But you have to keep in mind that you should end the exercise at the same speed. So not stop the first three times 200 on an average split of two minutes. And then afterwards, the last three times 200 is on an average of 210 or 25. No, you have really to look for the intensity that really you can maintain during the whole exercise. Mm. That's very, or let's say a lot of people uh, in literature will describe that kind of exercise as VO2 max training yeah? or threshold training. These are all power Exercises. These are not so threshold work or highest possible speed during a longer uh, duration is all about power. It's not about capacity. In the capacity workout that you described, what I find interesting, and I'm sure many listeners will find interesting, is that uh, you described that the 50s there are really a maximum effort. So, so the speed there is higher than your VVO2 max for the for the swimmer, and that's something that. Absolutely. That I think is uh, quite new to a lot of people, including myself. So can you explain why why that is? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, that's not so new because uh, 1970s, uh, in the 1970s, there was already bioptical uh, studies or bioptic studies showing that really, if you want to trigger all mitochondria, and these mitochondria are really the parts in the cell where you produce your aerobic energy or where that deliver the aerobic energy. If really you want to trigger them all, you really need to go above or let's say to a very high intensity. Otherwise, it will only be a part of your mitochondria that will receive a training impulse. Huh? And at a low speed, what was what is very common in, in, in training uh, literature, long distance at an easy pace for aerobic development. If you would l use that type of exercise, then only your mitochondria in the red muscle fibers or in the slow muscle fibers will be mainly activated, maybe for 85, 90%. Yeah. But a lot of other mitochondria that also contribute to the aerobic energy supply yeah, and certainly to a higher level of performance, they need really the more intensive work to be also or to, to be also involved in the development of aerobic capacity. Yeah, that that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. That's uh, that's a good explanation. Uh, I, so uh, so so the, the reason that, for example, a classic what has been called a VO2 max workout, something like eight times two minutes. So let's say we have a, a swimmer that swims uh, uh, two minutes for like 150 meters in two minutes, uh, an, mm -hmm. an age group swimmer. Uh, so 15 times 150 meters and uh, sort of a one-to-one -one or two-to-one work to rest ratio. You're saying that that really is too slow to really activate uh, all of the muscle fiber. It's, it's, it's yeah. mainly going to activate the mitochondria in the slow muscle slow twitch muscle fiber there and that's the reason why it's not as good yeah yeah okay because there is also let's say and and that's let's say where we you know we spoke a lot about the aerobic capacity but in fact you have also <laughs> a little brother which is the anaerobic capacity yeah it's also a property of the muscle fibers but not to consume oxygen but to produce lactate or, produ or to produce pyruvate that's the same yeah? and in fact that's the glycolysis and the glycolysis is in fact the main provider of fuel for your oxygen system so if you are not able to produce enough pyruvate that would force the aerobic system or to have a lack on fuel, and if there is a lack on fuel, why should the system develop? Yeah, because the system will say, I can do the work I need to do, so why should I be more powerful, or why, sh why should I improve my capacity? Or you will have to look for this fuel from other sources, such as fat or as proteins. That's also possible or ketones, which is a very, uh, let's say, hot topic at the moment. Mm. Uh, so that means that um, if your anaerobic capacity is not strong enough, that will always be, or that will also provide problems to develop your aerobic capacity. Mm. So they are not, it's, it's not really that you can say, you cannot split them. They're also working together. And if you really want to be good on short distance, then your VLA max or your anaerobic capacity may be very high. There is no problem. Yeah? So you will perform well as well aerobically as anaerobically. However, if you are a triathlete from, uh, how, uh, 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 let's say, um, an Ironman or, or even a, 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 an Olympic distance, if then your anaerobic capacity is too high, yeah, then you will earn problems during the race. So it must be in a certain balance, but at least it must be strong enough to enable the aerobic metabolism yeah, to improve or to grow or to be more powerful, to, to have a higher cap, to, to improve their capacity, its capacity. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think that you you know Sebastian Weber, and yeah. uh, he's uh, been a guest before on the show and talked about 
about those concepts quite a bit, so so many listeners are familiar with that. Uh, yeah, when it comes from the, to it's from the same uh, school. Eh? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh. Uh, when it comes to developing your aerobic and anaerobic capacities and powers, what would you suggest for triathletes or endurance athletes in longer events? So a sprint triathlon is fifty minutes, and an Ironman is eight hours on the elite side. So what would be a good way in terms of periodization or prioritization to, to work on, on the different uh, aspects here of aerobic and anaerobic capacity and power? Yeah, that, that's, that's really the most difficult question you can ask me. Yeah? And for t- the main reason why it's so difficult is that the response to a training exercise to improve aerobic or anaerobic capacity can differ in time strongly from one athlete to the other. So what we are doing with lactate testing is just measuring this response time to just make a good estimation in the planning of how much time do we need to spend in capacity or how much time do we need to spend in power and how much must it be aerobic and how, or let's say more aerobically focused or how much has really to be more anaerobically uh, anaerobic focused so it's a very difficult question but if you do are not uh, let's say able or if it's not worth to do all these very complicated tests yeah what can be a general or let's say a starting point is that if you are a triathlete for a short distance yeah, in let's say in the build-up phase if you do one exercise as i just described it yeah, with these very short high intensive and the rest is very easy and you are training four times a week then one on four is certainly enough. Yeah? So that means that, in fact, three of the four training units a week would be at a very, very low pace and easy. And only one of them can be, let's say, will contain these very high-intensity uh, high spikes. Yeah. Yeah? And that's for the build-up phase. And it will, if you want, if you go to the to the competition, then let's say week minus two, week minus three, uh, then you should replace this, um, let's say, aerobic capacity, these high spikes at high intensity and a lot of easy. Then you should progress more and more to more a threshold work where you really will maintain uh, moderate speed for longer times. And if you do that as a, let's say, as, as not as a top athlete, but as an, let's say, uh, an, an, an age group someone who amateur. is do, yeah, yeah, an amateur, then, then if you do that also once a week, that's enough. Yeah. You don't need to do more because most triathletes are doing too much quality work. And what, what, are, is, what is the problem? Can, can you explain them. what the problem with that may be? Um, how is that a problem? Yeah. The problem is that if you do too much at higher or let's say moderate intensity, what you will do is always triggering a development in the ana- in the aerobic power area. And we know that if you do too much work in the aerobic power work, you lose a lot of your aerobic capacity. Yeah? So that means the more you want to prepare your competition, if you do too much quality work, you will lose capacity of your engine. And then you have to make the calculation. Yeah? What is best if I have 70% from 80 milliliter VO2 max, which is 56, or I maybe have 19, but I lost my capacities from 80 to 60, and then I have 63 milliliter. So this is really a balance you have to make and to see, okay, what level or how far can I go that despite losing capacity, but improving the percentage I can use from my capacity, which is the best balance to have the highest usable oxygen uptake during the race. 
and that's a that's a huge calculation. And, m m and most listeners is, probably and, and don't the, have access to to these kinds of calculations and lab yeah, tests. Yeah. But uh, what you said there yeah. with with being mindful of not doing too much intensity, I think that uh, can already serve yeah. as a great starting point to uh, to help it, uh, it, tip the balance, so to say. That's that's one hundred percent true. Because you have to imagine uh, people who want, who like to do triathlon. These are not sprinter types. These people like to work for a long time. And if at high speed, they like it. Yeah? So most of the time, the net, their, uh, their, what should I say, their, their feeling or their motivation is to go as fast as possible for a long period. And that's not the right intention. Yeah, or that's not the right attitude. So if you can change already a little bit that attitude, it can give you an immense advantage in competition. Mm. And, and what about uh, the balance between aerobic and anaerobic throughout the training period? If we start far out from the race and uh, and what happens closer to the race, can you describe what uh, how to balance those two? In uh, f with respect to in a race or with respect, with respect to, to training? training, so you had the example here with the sprint yeah. distance triathlete. So we talked about the development of capacity and power, but if we talk about the aerobic and anaerobic development here, so how would you do that? Um, we would we most of the time we we if we don't really know the athlete, yeah. Then we go to this one quality training a week. Yeah? And quality training in the preparation, it's about during two or three weeks yeah, where you increase the volume per week yeah? and where also you will replace aerobic capacity training by aerobic power training sets. So you will train more and more threshold work and your volume a week will also increase. And then you take one week of regeneration or one and a half week regeneration to the competition. Uh, that's the main framework of what we like, of what we suggest. Now, what happens in triathlon is, <laughs> is, it, is something very specific because you will not work only for one discipline but you will work for three disciplines. And it's really important not to lose too many, too much energy, for example, in swimming, if you go for an Ironman. Yeah? And therefore, suffer a lot or losing a lot of time in cycling and running. So that means also that volume increase in the competition preparation will mainly occur in running and certainly in cycling, but not so much in swimming. Mm. Yeah? And what we also will do in during the preparation phase is to make within the same training session or in two consecutive training sessions to combine different disciplines. Yeah? And that's totally different if you work in the build-up phase or if you want to improve capacity work. Then you say, okay, every week we'll have one main objective. Or it is in swimming, or it is in running, or it is in cycling, but we will never make a combination of, um, of, of uh, uh, main sports disciplines within a week if we are in the build-up phase. And that's something you have to plan in advance and you have to take into account how well uh, some people are in running or in cycling or in swimming from talent yeah? and not only from working and training. And that's what uh, what is important for periodization. But this is really for top level. You cannot afford all these efforts and all these time uh, necessary to to develop that for for let's say for amateurs or for people who like to go for a triathlon that's so, more professional so, so does that mean that when you have if you have a week where you're focusing on swimming your all your cycling and running would be at an at an easy pace or do you still have yeah, yeah. and also okay. at low volume yeah okay yeah for example swimming in a week will be let's say for for an average triathlete it will be about 25 20 20 20 25k in swimming yeah 
with maybe with this one on four, let's say high quality work. Mm -hmm. yeah? And then maybe there are still three or two running and cycling sessions. And if at that week we allocate that week for the specific or for the objective in uh, conditioning in swimming, then cycling and running will be at low volume, maybe cycling 250 or things like that, and uh, or uh, no, two times, then it will be maybe on the 120, and running in three sessions with maybe 30 or 25. So relatively low volumes. And and uh, are we now talking about, is this pretty similar if you coach an Olympic distance athlete or an Ironman athlete? So even an Ironman the, athlete would have those quite low volumes. Yeah, let's say the principles are the same. Yeah. yeah? But of course, the absolute numbers will differ yeah. because in an Olympic distance, it's not a race from eight hours. Yeah. And you have also uh, other characteristics like... Uh, uh, Possibilities to accelerate must be available, which is not so important for 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 uh, for the long distance. Yeah, it is. You need a certain flexibility in speed, but what is important is to to be able to to drive or to run or to swim on a very economic pace. Yeah, so that's something uh, different with uh, the Olympic distance. And uh, but the principle is the same. The, the the numbers can differ. The volume can differ. But to be honest, volume and quality blocks will differ. But not so. Or let's say this differ. The, the the differences will not be estimated or defined by the the distance. But mainly or in first instance by the properties of the conditioning profile. And to, to make it a little bit clear, if you have really poor capacities and you want to prepare a long distance event, then that's okay, that's all possible. But then also your volume will be much lower than, or let's say which be lower than, for example, if you have an Olympic triathlete that really want to be prepared for the Olympic Games and who has a lot, much higher capacities. Because as I told you, the main, the main important information coming from capacities are meant for training. Yeah? And therefore, if you have really poor capacities, then you should be very careful with your training. Otherwise, you will break the car. Yeah? If you're with a small engine, you always drive fast, 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 as fast as possible. You will break that car very quickly. Yeah? Or you, you, it, it, yeah, it, will, it, it will break. Very simple. And, and, and it sounds like you're, so you're applying this to volume as well. If you have a smaller engine, yeah. a smaller capacity, then also your volume must be yeah. lower. Yeah. It, it's interesting to hear, the, even though I know that this was just an example, uh, the week you just described with swim focus and two, maybe three bikes and runs. But if we look at how a lot of professional Ironman athletes are training, it sounds like uh, if you were coaching them or advising them, they would be training a lot less than they are. Yeah. Is that correct? That's 100%. And that was very successful with Luc van Lierde. That's very successful with Frederik van Lierde. We saw a lot of athletes uh, that came from other coaches and uh, did much lower volumes when we uh, guided the coaches. Yeah? And then suddenly they, be, they, were, um, they were really amazed that by doing less, they were faster in competition. Can you, can and you that's talk? not so unusual because you can also, you, you know, a training adaptation is always first breaking something to trigger the body to build up. Yeah. yeah. What is this? What is what is uh, described as super compensation? Yeah? Now, if you never give your organism the opportunity to super compensate because you always break, 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 break. Yeah, at the end of the story, you are broken, but you will not be a, a high-performance athlete. Yeah. You will learn to suffer, and that's also important, but it's not the only fact. Yeah? So to have the highest return of your training load, you always have to look for enough opportunity to supercompensate. 
and where you can do it, what is possible uh, or what is a trigger or what is a facilitator for uh, super compensation that's easy running easy dry easy cycling easy swimming these are really the 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 the, the, the time periods or the the phases where really you can have a super compensation and if you never give a possibility to super compensation then you will you will you will kill yourself can you can you give us the talk about the case studies of uh, Luke and Frederik van yeah. Leerde that you took yeah. to Ironman World Championships for for both of them and twice in the case of Luke? Yeah, so for him normally during the year, yeah, running was at maximum about forty k, thirty five, forty k, let's say a week. That was already. Uh, I will not say a tough, but a good training uh, volume for running. And there was only one quality work in running when uh, the week was really focused or was really uh, built for improving aerobic capacity in running. And only three, or let's say in the preparation, two or three weeks, he went really to very high vol for him, very high volumes of, let's say, 60, 70, 80, maybe once 90 kilometers running in a week. And for um, cycling, it was about maybe around 240, 300 in, in the, in the build-up phase. And in a competition preparation, then it went over 600. But that's only a very short period over a year. Yeah, maybe for uh, for each preparation only two or three weeks, not mm. more than that. Yeah. And, and, and he was a swimmer, so he came from swimming. Then, of course, volumes for swimming were relatively high. If we compare that with uh, for for with other triathletes, they are not who are not coming from swimming. Yeah, like Bart Arnauts and so. We, we we don't give him so much volume in swimming because he's not really a good swimmer. So he will break more down than he can, will be able to build up. And, and that doesn't make sense. Mm. So what was Luke's total weekly volume in hours, if you know roughly, in different I phases of the... That I, can't, I can't tell you that. Because we always work in, 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 in meters and kilometers, but not in, in hours. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, but it, it's, it sounds like it, uh, it was significantly less than a lot of oh, yes. professionals yes. these days yes. are yes. training. Uh, because the the problem you have, you can do more, yeah. And I'm certainly not saying that doing more is bad, yeah. But at least if you do more, you must be sure that you have a return of your investment. You understand what I mean? Yes, and, so, and but yeah, the the question is, how do you know that? That's what we. That's why we are doing these lactate like, tests, really to so see, describe that. Yeah, uh, sorry. So, so go ahead and describe that. Let's yeah, so, go into lactate yeah. testing. So, what, how we are we are using the lactate is, is is in a way different from what normally people know about lactate, because we use the lactate values only as a kind of input values for these simulation models. Uh, the these simulation models will allow us to really go to the muscle characteristics. Yeah, or to define or to describe the muscle characteristics that give us much more reliable information on what happens on the capacity and what happens on the power level. And if we see that for some athletes, a certain plan, instead of providing an incremental or an improvement in capacities, it gives you an improvement in power then we know that something is wrong between the communication of the training plan and the reaction of the, the athlete. And this is a question of working with an athlete two, three or four years to uh, test him in different cases and to see how well or how bad he responds to certain characteristics of training. And that's something where, for example, you can see or you can observe or you can find out for some athletes that doing only one anaerobic capacity exercise a month is already enough to keep his anaerobic capacity to a, let's say, acceptable level. And if you do more, you will spend energy that bring or that have no improvement or that brings no return of all efforts you are doing. 
Yeah? For mm -hmm. other athletes, maybe you see that once a week, anaerobic capacity is needed to, to have a response. So you have to, 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 to check it and, and to test it to see how well an athlete is responding to different uh, characteristics of, of, a, of a training setting, of a training program. And that you can do with these lactate tests in, in order to see, okay, what's, what do we have now an improvement in, in, in the capacities or power? Or are we really getting the results we expected from certain training exercises or some training programs? And if we don't have it, then we know that this is not the way to do it for that guy. Maybe it's, it's good for another athlete, but not for, uh, for the athlete in, uh, that we want to, to, where we want to improve the aerobic capacity. And that can be very individual. There is a general rule and you can find these rules or you can find these characteristics in the signs of winning. Uh, and I explained already one of them with respect to aerobic capacity. So there are characteristics where we really know these. If we do an exercise with these characteristics, very, very probably you will have an adaptation in that direction. But how much and how often that exercise is needed to really have that adaptation, that's something you really have to find out uh, for each athlete separately. And then you can already see that this is something that is for top athletes or, or for, for athletes on, 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 let's say, international level. But this is certainly not something we can do for, uh, or let's say, that, that, that we can do for, for every triathlete. Yeah, of course. How how often do you test these top triathletes and top athletes? Top athletes, let's say, at least we need, a, let's say, a delay or, or a gap or, or a, 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 let's say, an interval of about six weeks. And most of time, what we also work with in a planning is with a mesocycle. And to explain you what we are, what for us is a mesocycle, a mesocycle is a combination of a time period where really you train hard or you train a lot or you were really training. And then you combine that period with a next period where really you do not too much, where you really allow the, the organism to come to a super compensation. And these both a working phase with a super compensation phase, that combination is for us a mesocycle. And that allows really in the working phase yeah, to maybe do a little bit more than you are able to do. Yeah. At the end, if that recovery phase, so the easy period of that mesocycle is easy yeah, and not too voluminous, then this is the best way to be sure that there is a super compensation. And where we are interested in is, of course, have the measurements in or at the end of the super compensation phase and not at the end where really we, we have no correct idea of how much a training program hurts the athlete. Do you understand? So. Yes. Yes. If we really work with top athletes, then we really want to test in the first week of each mesocycle to be sure that this is the most, or let's say that's the, the period or that's the week where you have the highest probability to measure the super compensation mm. and not the fatigue of the training. Yeah. yeah, That's one point. And for very low level athletes, then we mainly work with one week of training, one week of recovery. Yeah? If you have an average level of athletes, then most of the time it's two weeks of training, one week of recovery. Yeah? That combination in the mesocycle. And only for very good athletes, we go to three weeks of training combined or followed up by two weeks of super compensation training. Yeah. So that means if you really need about two mesocycles to see any effect of aerobic or anaerobic capacity development, it takes you quickly to six to from six to ten weeks to repeat the, the, the lactate tests. And do more lactate tests, it's nice. It gives you supplementary information that can be very good for fine-tuning the training programs. But at the end of the story, what we are most interested in is really to see 
these endpoints, these uh, what we call what we call consistent training adaptation. So where we really see the effect after supercompensation. That's really the the reference points we want to 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 observe or we want to quantify in order to see okay. Are we on the right track with our program or do we need to adjust our program? So you use the, the lactate testing to to figure out what needs to be worked on and the capacities are important in particular to uh, to think about the training design there. What about when we think about the individual workouts? So for example, how hard an athlete should go in their quality work. Do you use the lactate yeah. testing as input for that as well? And if so, how do you do that? Uh, yeah yes and no yes because okay uh, it's always interesting to to quantify what happens during training yeah? and therefore we certainly uh, do estimations of training intensity based on the lactate test but at the end of the story what's really important is is how well uh, an athlete perform during or let's say can make a, a difference between recovery and intensive work. Yeah. That means that when we make our calculations of training intensity, it's always important also to listen to the athlete. And one of the findings we had with the research we did in, in Cologne with Marner and, and for my PhD was that a certain lactate level is certainly not a good reference for training intensity. That means if really you work with two athletes and you say, okay, this is a training set, you will do them all on the same lactate level. Yeah? First of all, you will see that the impact of the same lactate level on each of both athletes can be totally different. So it's not because you are training at two or two and a half, three or four millimole that each athlete doing that is doing the same training exercise. That's one of the findings. So that means that we do not, or let's say it's not good enough to know or to estimate training intensity at certain lactate levels. What is important is really to have a good estimation of what impact a certain lactate level training or a training set at a certain lactate level, what impact can be expected on the total organism? And that is certainly a much more difficult uh, component in a training uh, evaluation than only looking to the lactate values. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. It's complicated. Eh? I know it, it, it's not easy material, yeah. but uh, that's also why there is so many or there are so many mistakes or many, uh, let's say, uh, unexpected or, 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 or I don't know exact the name in, in English, but a lot of people or a lot of uh, physiologists, physiologists don't say that lactate is useless yeah? because it is not a, a reliable measurement. However, we know that the measurement is very reliable but the interpretation and the implementation in training is very, very difficult. So let me ask you. And therefore, yeah. Let, let me ask you this: uh, the normal ramp test, lactate ramp test, where you go for yeah. let's say five minutes and then you increase the intensity and you take a lactate sample and you draw the curve and you talk and yeah. uh, you get an estimate of your uh, quote-unquote lactate thresholds. What's your opinion on that? My opinion is that it's a good measurement for the aerobic power, but you only have the information that someone saw a car driving 240 km per hour on the highway. But you have no idea about how strong is the engine. Is maybe that speed requiring 90% of the capacities of the engine? Or is that speed requiring only 70%? And for whatever reason, he's not able to use more than 70%. That information will, you will not have that information by such a kind of test. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the reason why we, 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 we skip that way of working. Uh, and we never work with a lactate curve uh, to say, okay, it goes to the right. That's good. Or it's go to the left. That's bad. No, we really 
go with these values or with these lactate values to enter these values in a simulation program that projects what are different levels of capacities that can explain that performance. Mm. And based on that estimation, you can say, okay, this guy, okay, that's very nice what I see uh, at, uh, let's say, at the VMAX speed. But at the, at the end, it's nothing special for that guy. He should even be better than that. And on the other side, you can have uh, the same result, but with our simulation models, you can see, okay, whoa, it's amazing that this guy can be so fast with such a small engine. And that's a big part of information you will get for your training because if you give both athletes the same training one will be good and the other will die yeah we have such beautiful example of two 10k runners female runners who prepared the olympic games in seoul that's already a long time ago where we didn't have these simulation programs and both athletes were really very, very close to each other on the 10K. And uh, we, gave, we didn't know at that time uh, this uh, difference between capacities and power. And we simply gave both athletes the same training, same volume a week, same structure in intensity, etc., etc. And at the end of the story, one of the girls was very good in Seoul and the other was really a disaster. So what was the reason? And it was not really mentally or it was not medical. All these things were checked. And let's say one or two years later, when we developed these uh, models for simulation, then we could find out that one of these girls, and that was the one who, was, who performed bad on the Olympic Games, that was a girl who was able to run very fast with a very small engine. So by giving... That girl, the same volume as the other girl, for the other it was okay, but for the girl with the small engine, it was too much. So she could never super compensate from that workload. But this was something we, we discovered afterwards because at the time uh, of, the, of, of the preparation to Seoul, we, we had not, or let's say I had, we, we had not these uh, uh, possibilities to, to make these simulations. But this is a very clean example where maybe the curve may be totally overlap. Uh, both curves may overlap each other very, very closely. But at the end, what creates the curve or what generates the lactate curve can be totally different. And that's so tricky and that's so dangerous if you don't make the right interpretation of a lactate curve. And, and, and therefore, you will also automatically give wrong uh, advices for training. That's a, a great overview. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, final question before the rapid fire questions. Let's talk a little bit about periodization uh, from a year, uh, from, from a year level or even multi-year level, wherever you want to start down to the microcycle or weekly level. How, how do you plan periodization? And of course, this is going to be different depending on an athlete. So maybe you want to use an example uh, or some, uh, yeah, use an example if you want to, but uh, just uh, discuss your your opinions on periodization and how you how you do that. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, what we what we uh, do is to 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 discuss with the athlete or with his coach uh, what are the the main competitions where you want to be at top level. Yeah? And let's say the better the athlete, the more peak moments you can have in a season. Yeah. If, for example, for a, um, a guy who internationally uh, achieved top 10, it's not so difficult and, and he has good capacities. It's not so difficult to have three, four, five peak moments a year. So that means that you during the year, you will already have four to five macro cycle. Yeah? That means from start of the, the, the preparation till the competition, the main competition, that's a macro. Yeah? So on the other hand, if you have poorer athletes where you know that capacities are, let's say, or there is a lack of capacities, yeah, then it's better only to plan one or maybe two or maybe a third small peak a year, but certainly not more than three. 
Because what happens is that if you have a lot of top competitions, they all need a certain preparation. That preparation is power focused. And if you do a lot of power, we know that you lose capacities. So for the athletes who build up their capacity during years and where these capacities are very stable, despite also doing a lot of power work, you can afford a lot of peaks per year. Yeah? And then your macro can be very small. You can maybe have uh, six weeks of uh, restoring capacities and then about two, three to four weeks preparation. That means you are about you have about 10 weeks of, of, of a macro, not longer than that, and that works. Yeah? You, so you can have six uh, build up and four preparation, inclusive competition, and then you repeat that three or four, five mm-hmm. times a year. Yeah, five is a little bit, but, but four yeah. times a year. If you are a lower level, then you have already to plan at least, let's say, 12 to 16 weeks for building up. And due to the fact that the capacities are not so strong, your development of power will will go faster, will, will uh, be sooner. That means then we, we speak already about 12 to 14 weeks build up and two to three weeks preparation, inclusive the competition. Then you have a, you are already about, let's say, 16, 17, 18 weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah? That means that you cannot have a good buildup of your capacities by doing short macros. You have to go for longer macros because your build the proportion of buildup, your capacities will take much more uh, time than for top athletes. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, but you see that even for let's say average athletes, yeah, if you go for twelve weeks of build-up phase, that may be four two plus one meso cycles, yeah, and one two plus two or three plus one, or, or th- there are different possibilities uh, to prepare the competition. Yeah, you will have about 16 weeks for that average athlete. Yeah. And that means if you have 16 weeks, maybe you can have three peaks, but certainly not more than that. Absolutely. Anything else that uh, that goes into uh, into the planning uh, and design of the what, what you put into the different uh, mesocycles within, within the plan or anything, anything yeah. that we yeah. should discuss? Yeah. Oh, then uh, we speak about uh, topics like: uh, Do you want to go in altitude training? Because if you go in altitude, then you also have to 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 take into consideration certain uh, adaptation mechanisms that take longer or slower or faster, so or also to prepare the altitude training. So that's one of them. Then also, uh, but that's a little bit more for. A uh, higher level of, of triathletes, uh, how do they think they can qualify for the most important competition? Yeah, because in swimming, most of the time it's easy. Yeah, if well, it's easy, if you swim once, your your cut time, yeah, you are selected and that's it. Yeah, but in triathlon, you need a lot, you need to to gather points. So it's not enough to have one good race in a year, or sometimes it is, but not always. Most of the time, not. Yeah. So you need to take also in consideration other competitions where maybe you are not one hundred percent prepared, but at least that fit, that still fit within a build-up philosophy. But on the other hand, don't destroy too much or don't destroy too much the preparation of the or the improvement of the capacities. Yeah? And that's a big puzzle. And there is no really one rule, but it's always to look and to group rather your competitions just to make more time free to really work on, on capacities. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, yes. So it's better to have maybe one month, no competitions, and to be focused on on pure capacity work. And then maybe in the next three weeks, you do two or three competitions. You see? 
Yep. That's less disadvantage or that there, you have less disadvantage with, with that way of approach than if you would say, okay, on two months, every two weeks I do a competition because that really destroy the whole uh, philosophy of where do I have space or what is most appropriate or can I create the most appropriate way to build up capacities and and to have uh, power development well balanced with the capacities? So sometimes you need to look for uh, for for how to to make combinations so that you can have the best of it. And let's take an example. Let's say we have an, yeah. an amateur athlete and uh, they have two peaks in a year, so they have yeah. two sixteen-week macro cycles with. Yeah. 12 weeks for capacity development and four weeks for yeah. power and uh, the race. So yeah. in, in those 12 weeks uh, before each race, when we're working on the capacities, so you might probably something like four times two weeks of work, one week of recovery. But yeah. how do we know like which weeks do we focus on swimming capacities and uh, cycling, running? Yeah. How do yeah. you do that? Yeah. that that's a, a question of uh, knowing how well they are in different disciplines. Yeah. For example, if if you have a two plus one week yeah, meso cycle, if if you have a two plus one uh, meso cycle, we always like to start with the discipline which is the weakest for the athlete. Because the reason for that is that if you are already to a certain, if you are already fatigued to a certain level, it will be certainly more difficult to develop your weak points. Or your weaknesses. Yeah. So we start always the the let's say the meso with the weakest discipline, and the second week will then rather be let's say one of the two others. And most of the time, it's swimming because most of the triathletes are not really coming from swimming, yeah. yeah. And therefore, it's very important from swimming that from a technical, from a neuromotoric perspective, you are fresh enough to be able to swim technically as good as possible. Because you can lose a lot of energy in swimming. So if you really you don't uh, control the movement in a good way, uh, you will you can lose a lot and gain only a little. And so we put that in the first week for most of the triathletes. And then let's say we also know that running is a more difficult discipline to develop than cycling. So what happens then is that we put swimming in the first week and the second week is then more so dominate is, is uh, yeah, the dominant or is the, 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 as the objective of running or cycling, depending all it, to have a summary over the 16 weeks to have your second discipline also on the second place with respect to how many weeks do I spend to that sp- that discipline. Yeah? And yeah. mostly it's running. Yeah. yeah? And, the, and the, the, the regeneration week, that's, let's say, you do all the free sports, but at a very low level, at an easy level, to be sure that you can recover and that you can super compensate. Yes, got it. There is, uh, of course, a lot of detail that we could go into uh, because, uh, well, yeah, I've read your book, Science of Winning. It's uh, great, but I'm going to read it again uh, because there's a lot to take in and I don't think that it's possible to to take in all the information in just one read. I highly encourage listeners to go and get that book as well. Uh, I think that we we will end this discussion here. It's been really great to talk about some of these topics that you discuss in more depth in your book. But uh, final few questions. These are rapid fire, so uh, really quick and short answers. One sentence or 15 seconds or less. And the first question here is, what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon or endurance sport? <laughs> I have to disappoint you because I, we are already so much in sports and all these things that what I like is photography. So uh, going outside and make uh, pictures from flowers, from people, that's something I like very much. Fair enough. <laughs> not books, not articles. <laughs> yeah. <so>. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career? Yeah, so uh, with all what I explained to you when I was a swimmer and I could have that insight, it would certainly have increased the, the training efficiency. So, But okay, that's uh, history. Yeah. 
And and who is somebody in endurance sports that uh, you look up to and admire? In endurance sports, I don't know really. I like more, let's say, the middle distance. And why? Because middle distance athletes, most of the time, their preparation and their let's say bringing them to the peak is much more complex than than long distance runners. Yes, yeah, because so of I like much more these uh, <laughs> these middle distance. So, so who is your favorite middle distance athlete? Uh, for me, it was uh, Peter van den Ogenband in swimming. Uh, yeah, and um, uh, and it was also uh, Nathan uh, Kahan, who was an eight hundred meter runner, a Belgian eight hundred meter runner, who was really also a very special guy. Uh, as well from attitude, as well as from physics, from physiologic. So that was also a great guy to work with. So that was a, that was really one of the guys. I say, wow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is, or do you have any anything else? Anything you'd like to mention uh, about your own work or or any anything that the listeners should know? Uh, now is your chance to do so. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. What I, what, what I think, what is important for all people who are doing sport, that uh, really don't be too, uh, uh, too, too extreme. Uh, I know most of people they are doing sport because they want to 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 go over certain borders. They want to 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 meet challenges, but sometimes you have to take it easy and and enjoy the time. So it must not always be suffering. That's uh, that's a good note to end on. Uh, thank you so much, Jan. It was uh, a real pleasure talking to you. You're welcome. I really hope that you enjoyed that interview. It's a fascinating topic. It is quite complex. And um, as we talked about, uh, not necessarily all of the intricacies here are really available for amateur athletes to implement in their training. As uh, Unless you have somebody like Jan who to test you regularly, it, uh, it is obviously very difficult to, to get all of the uh, all of the fine details but i think that the there are a few takeaways that we can take anyway first of all i think that the the point that jan makes about both uh, the number of the amount of quality work that triathletes do may be way too much but also he said the same thing about the the volume that uh, in many cases uh, the volumes that uh, us triathletes train at is uh, is too big uh, and uh, it relates. It is related to the capacities that you have, your aerobic, aerobic and anaerobic capacity. Those are the limiting factors for how much you should be training. So, so that that's a really interesting association. And I, I'll be sure to go and read those chapters again in the Science of Winning to to really get the full full gist of it. And I encourage you to do the same. Science of Winning, by the way, is only available on Kindle, which is a bit unfortunate, I have to say. Uh, I would love to have the the print copy, but uh, but it's uh, it's way better to have it on Kindle than to not have it. That's uh, that's for sure. So so that was one of the big takeaways for me, and uh, and another one really is uh, the number of weeks in a build up that is uh, dedicated to capacity training uh, rather than to power training. So utilization of the capacity, because when you do the power training, uh, you are potentially uh, potentially reducing your capacities. So, so that's another fascinating, fascinating insight. For example, in a 16-week build, dedicating 12 of those weeks to just developing the capacities, and only four of those to to the power training. Really interesting stuff. And uh, I want to thank Jan again for coming on the show. Like I said at the beginning, I've been looking forward to this since episode one of this podcast in February 2017. So it was great to talk to Jan. As usual, you can find the show notes for this episode on thattriathlonshow.com. And stay subscribed to the podcast or subscribe if you haven't yet, because we have plenty of great episodes coming your way very, very soon. For example, next Monday, I interview Tim Cusick, who is the product leader of WKO5, the analytics software. And Tim Cusick, in addition to being the product leader, is a fantastic coach of some world-class athletes. So combining the data and the, the coaching there aspect is something that we go into in addition to, of course, the obvious things like what's new in WK05. So I thought that was a fantastic chat, even if you're not interested in, in WK05 as a software, but some of the coaching takeaways 
or training takeaways for that matter if you're a self-coached athlete so so stay subscribed so you don't miss anything and of course Thursday's Q&A episodes will keep coming out so plenty of content for you to consume big thanks finally to Roka that you can find on roka.com check out their wetsuits dry suits swim skins goggles and high performance eyewear and get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS all caps and a big thanks to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Take their free online sweat test to get an individualized hydration strategy for your next race. And try your first box or tube of electrolytes for free with the promo code that's Triathlon Show, all on word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.